Thank you, um, and thanks for coming. If you feel anything like I do this morning, uh, then I really appreciate you coming in uh, to see my talk. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about alien species at the global scale, global species richness patterns of, of aliens. And um, alien species or biotic exchange of, of species around the world is recognised as a signature of anthropogenic um, of, of the Anthropocene, excuse me. So we've introduced many alien species um, over geographic barriers, intentionally or inten unintentionally. And some of those species, once we've introduced them, are able to establish their own self-sustaining populations. And some of those species might actually increase in, a, in their abundance and spread within the new range and become what we call invasive. So we find this... Um, this phenomenon um, happening at the moment, but Darwin, as with so many ideas in ecology, got their way before us 150 years ago and wondered why some parts of the world contained so many more established alien species than others. But Darwin didn't have computers or the internet, um, and so it's only relatively recently that we've been able to actually look at a global scale at the um, extent to which we have broken down biogeographic barriers. So, for example, we've shown in a recent study for plants that there are more than 13,000 plant species that have established self-sustaining populations outside of their native ranges. As this map shows here, you can see particular hotspots in, for example, uh, the UK, but also along the seaboards of North America. You can't quite see it here, but also Hawaii too. So that's the picture for plants, but what about other taxonomic groups? So what about many vertebrate species that are intentionally introduced, or perhaps also invertebrates that are unintentionally introduced? And so what I've been working on at the moment is trying to work out across multiple taxonomic groups which um, parts of the world are hotspots for alien established species. Moreover, I'm assessing uh, why some regions tend to be hotter than others across those taxonomic groups. And I've been looking at how similar um, global patterns are for different taxonomic groups when we compare them. So the taxonomic groups that I've been looking at are uh, the plants, so that's using our GLONAF database. But I've also collated data sets from uh, my co-authors, uh, Phil Cassie, uh, Tim Blackburn and Sally Scrivens on mammals. We also have a database, um, again, Tim Blackburn's and Ellie Dyer's database on um, avian species, on birds. We've got reptiles, which we've built a database ourselves. And we've also got amphibians by the same authors. We have uh, fishes, freshwater fishes, using fish base and other data sources such as the US Geological Survey. Um, and we've got data on ants <coughs> from the Ant Maps project. And then we've also got data on spiders from the World Spider Catalog. So because this data, um, in terms of the species richness data, uh, from these different data sets is at different spatial scales, what I've had to do is to try and find one uh, framework within which I can look at regional species richness. So I've chosen to use the taxonomic database working group framework, and this consists of a set of 609 geopolitical regions, which you can see on the left here, and those are nested within 52 subcontinental and then within another nine continental regions, as shown on the right-hand side there. And so within each of those 609 geopolitical regions, I have calculated the species richness for each of my taxonomic groups. And 
Because the ranges of species which this value is so different for the different taxonomic groups, rather than just calculating a simple mean, I've worked out the relative richness per taxon per region, which is the richness for that region divided by the maximum for the taxonomic group. So that puts everything on a scale from zero to one. And then I've just calculated a simple average richness across those taxonomic groups. And then in order to take into account area, I've fitted uh, just a simple linear model of average richness as a function of area, and then I've used the residuals as my indicator of, of species richness across taxonomic groups, correcting for area. And so if we group those uh, values, those species richness values into percentile groupings, we can look at where is hot and where is not in the world in terms of alien species richness across these taxonomic groups. So I'll just point out a few here. So if we look at the upper 2.5% um, of regions, we've got Hawaii here. We've also got California and Florida popping out and Italy as well and the New Zealand islands. If we group those um, regions according to the nine continental regions that they occur in, we can see that among the top 2.5% sorry, of regions, we've got around a quarter of them um, occurring in the Pacific region. And then if we look here at the lower sort of cold spots, the lower 2.5% of regions, we see we've got Northern America here and also tropical Asia. So they tend not to have so many alien species. So there are some very brief, um, broad brushstroke uh, patterns uh, across the globe, across those taxonomic groups. But why are some of those regions hot spots and why are some of them cold spots? Well, there could be a number of reasons. So first of all, islands might be hot spots, particularly ones that are far away from mainland regions, if they have higher introduction rates and maybe they have more vacant niches because fewer native species have been able to get there. We might expect in mainland areas, uh, coastal regions to be hotter than um, inland regions, as these may be major introduction points uh, via ports for, for alien species, and they may also have higher population densities. GDP per capita might be important, as it underlies greater numbers of introductions per region, but it also um, is related to land use change and intensification, which might increase the ease with which species can establish in a new region. Sampling effort might be important. So it might be that in certain parts of the world, say like the UK and North America, we're particularly good at going out and systematically surveying our native species. And we could use that to say, OK, if we've got a high percentage completeness of our native species inventories uh, based on things like uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, then that might also indicate that, yes, we're also good at recording our alien species in a region. And then finally, as for native species um, richness uh, patterns globally, mean annual temperature or climate in general, so temperature and pre precipitation might be important drivers of alien species richness too. So what I'm going to walk you through now is just a couple of exploratory graphs where I've actually looked at um, the, the importance of these different variables in explaining uh, alien species richness. So first of all, if we look at the island mainland difference, then what do we see? Well, we see that mainland regions do actually tend to have fewer on average uh, alien species. And if we look just at mainland regions and uh, don't worry about the island ones for the time being, then yes, we do have a tendency for coastal regions to have a higher alien species richness too, compared to landlocked regions. And if we look at the, um, the continuous variables, thank you, uh, then if we also split uh, mainland and island regions and look at them separately, so the mainland regions are shown by the blue lines, the uh, island regions are shown by the red ones, then we see a stronger or a steeper area, GDP per capita and temperature relationship for islands compared to mainland regions. We see that for both islands and mainlands, sampling effort that relationship is similar in strength. And then if we look at mean annual precipitation, there is only a relationship for mainland regions shown here, and that's a relatively weak relationship. 
And then if we look at the amount of variation explained by these models, by these variables for islands versus mainlands, we can see that for islands we're able to explain more variation in species richness of aliens than for mainland regions. So another way of looking at hotspots of alien species richness is to look at the overlap um, across taxonomic groups. So if we look, for example, at the regions which are within the 10% richest regions for um, our different taxonomic groups, how many taxonomic groups is that the case for within a particular region? So this is what this map shows, and we can see, it doesn't come out very well on this slide, but Hawaii and Florida, again, also have... Um, the majority of their groups being in the top 10%, okay? And if we look at the correlations, pairwise correlations among our different taxonomic groups, we see three strong correlations pro uh, popping up. So we've got plants and spiders strongly correlating, uh, mammals and birds, and also reptiles and ants. So this might be pointing towards common drivers for the species richness of these different taxonomic groups, which is one I, what I want to explore next. But in general, compared to, um, compared to native species, these correlations aren't very strong. So that suggests that taxonomic groups vary in their species richness patterns and in the potential drivers behind them. So to sum up, I've shown that islands and coastal regions do tend to be alien species hotspots. And also there tends to be a stronger species area and temperature relationship for islands compared to mainlands. One reason for this might be is that islands, because they are smaller, they are simpler systems, so it might be that these signals are, are, are more apparent than for more complex, larger mainland regions. Taxonomic groups, three pairs in particular, do show some correlation, but it's not always strong across all taxonomic groups, suggesting that there are different drivers for the different taxonomic groups that I've looked at. So... What I want to do next is, is try to explain those differences among taxonomic groups. And one caveat I'd like to mention is that I, need, I still need to control for numbers of species introduced, so in other words, colonization pressure, because at the moment I can't really separate out the drivers of introduction versus the drivers of establishment. And so that's the next uh, project that I want to work on. So I just want to conclude by thanking um, extra co-authors and my funders and also to put a plug in for um, a BES symposium which is going to be held in July in Durham which I'm organising in July on the macroecology of alien species. So you can register I think starting next week so if you want to, want to come along then have a look at the BES website. There's some information there already. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess from the region perspective, what you could try to do is look at something like colonial history and say, okay, has a region been established, say, in the 1500s by, by the Spanish or in the 1700s by the British? And then does it matter when those places have been colonised or who colonised those places in terms of the number of species that you find there? Well, I've got data on colonial history and also the language of different regions, so those are two, two variables that I could look at in some more detail. From the species perspective, what I presented is just purely looking at the species richness numbers, but I'm working with colleagues um, who have been doing some work which should be coming out soon, uh, looking at when species have actually been introduced and accumulation over time. So keep an eye out for that. Cheers. That's a great question, and that's something that maybe we can discuss in the symposium in July. So, yeah, I don't have the answer to that yet, though. Yeah. One of the, going back, considering what the 
not there in terms of the indigenous flora and fauna of, of a particular location. Like, for example, in New Zealand, no native land based mammals. Mm. Yeah, so if you have those vacant niches, say, for mammals, then you'd expect a lot of mammals to be um, establishing in somewhere like New Zealand, that's true. Uh, for plants, we are starting to look at the importance of the phylogenetic makeup of, of those native floras across a large number of regions, and that, that works upcoming. Yeah, I suspect that you've got hitchhiking of spiders on, on plants sold for ornamental purposes, for example, and that's been suggested by Wolfgang Nentvig in the past, so, yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next speaker, Mara, who's going to be... The second, yeah, about there, yeah. yeah. Can I have the presenter here? <coughs> right, Morris from uh, Utrecht <laughs> University, which will be talking on the novel network tool for revealing patterns of community species resistance. Good morning, thank you for being here. Um, I already shift. Yes, I am here to uh, talk to you in the coming 10 minutes about a work that I developed with a group of physicists and ecologists, but also one economist, heterogeneous group. And I'm going to try to tell you how we adapted a method um, that is, was used in economy, uh, economics first. It's a network method, and uh, we applied it and translated, I would say, into ecology to study species richness patterns. Um, the type of study we are thinking of, but is not the only way you can use the method, that's how we used it for plant at large extent, but we kept the data at community scale, so we didn't need to upscale the data on, uh, with geographical upscaling, but we could keep the data at the the plot scale, so to say. So I'll show you first how this method, a little bit how it works, and then I will show you an, an application where we studied patterns of uh, Spanish forest richness. And one of the framework where you could think of using the method is the classical framework of species richness along continental gradient and how it co-varies with climate. What the, the, the most common way it's, of course, it's to aggregate local data uh, at some sort of grain, because, of course, local data are very noisy, so it's harder to study uh, patterns that occur at much larger scale. But, of course, um, being a um, biogeographical session, you uh, know that also scaling up data can introduce artifacts, for example, if you pull together areas that are dishomogeneous. So I'll introduce to you this new network method, the method of reflections. Um, the, what, what the method does is that it introduces a new proxy, an index, of potential species richness, hard words to use, or species pool, maybe. We call it generalized species richness. And in short, what it does, the method compares 
many communities closing con taxonomic composition throughout the data set. And so it starts from the species regions of a certain uh, plot, a certain site, so local information. Then it looks mathematically at the general pattern throughout your data set, which is the network, and then it gets back to calculate the, the, the index at local scale. A little hint of what is behind. Uh, it's n so then the, the you start with a presence absent matrix of species into sites. And you can define two basic quantities, of course. Count the species in the site, the species richness. Count in how many sites the species occur, the frequency of occurrence. What the method does, it reflects, that's why reflection, the information with, by mean of averaging, simple averages. So it starts averaging the species richness of the sites where a certain species occurs. And on the other hand, it averages the frequency of occurrence of all the species that live in a certain site. But it doesn't stop there. This had been done in the past before. It keeps going, it keeps making averages. And for the purpose of this talk, there is more information in the method, but um, the first thing that we notice is that the, when you can stop at a certain point because the method gets asymptotically, it converges, and you have this index, the even reflection here, as the averages go sort of like that, this contains the same information as the first quantity, the species richness but it has been corrected, so to say, by the network patterns and the community uh, structure throughout the network. Let me show you with a, with a little example. So we created a random synthetic data set where we, sorry, where we distributed the species um, along a certain environmental gradient, say precipitation, and we say that more species are likely to grow at low than at high precipitation with a linearly decreasing species number. So there are more species that like drier and less that like wetter areas. And then the species are randomly distributed according to their probability of occurrence. So if you look at species richness, because of the random processes, you don't really see anything. But when you apply the method, you find a neat and clean linear decreasing pattern in the generalized species richness. So the method picks up what is the signal in what you could call actually the species pool, so where the species got um, generated from. And this is not a spurious pattern. If you, uh, if you create another data set without a trend, just to show you, you don't get any, any, uh, any fake trend either. So this is, in short, the, what the method does, so it isolates the signal that is behind the species richness and provides an indicator of, call it as you like, potential species richness or something that is in the species pool. It's an indicator, so it's not a number of species. That's why I don't know exactly how to call it because it's not, I don't know, 25 species in the species pool, but I can pick up the trends that are in the species pool, thanks to this, and something more, but let's start with the trends. So, uh, we then used the Spanish forest inventory to study woody species richness in Spain. There were already studies, of course, and we noticed there was a contrast from, in particularly this study of Terradas and Coodor, which studied small-scale, selected, well-preserved forest stands, and they found that species richness was decreasing with mean annual rainfall in Spain. While a, a study using data that 50 by 50 grid scale found that species richness was actually increasing with mean annual rainfall. So can we say something about this? We used the um, data, as I mentioned, from the National Forest Inventory for woody species, more than 200 woody species, very large number of, of uh, forest sites, and we used the associated climate information. And, uh, okay, so this is the plot of the species richness of each of those 40,000 uh, forest sites versus on the left annual precipitation and here mean annual temperature. Of course, you cannot find any uh, model that really explains much variance here. You probably notice there is a 
decreasing trend in the maximum values. So you see that the highest species richness is observed at dry uh, and hot places, but yeah, not much more can be said. So let's see what happens when we apply the method of reflection. And when we apply the method, the generalized species richness decreases with mean annual, pre uh, annual precipitation with more than 40% of the variance explained by one variable alone. It, it increases with about 25% of the variance explained with mean annual temperature. So we observe that the potentially most species rich sites are actually the dry and hot corresponding to the species rich shrublands in, in the south of Spain. Could we pick up this by scaling up? Um, not really. The variance explained is less. There's, it's kind of changing with the scale, and especially it seems to go up. Or the average of this curve is going up, it's, and here is going down. So actually, the pattern is different. Um, so that's kind of a result that we couldn't pick up without applying our method. But it's at the same time, it's confirming something that other people already observed with selected forest stands. So it, it makes sense. And I don't say that we, if you apply this method to the, all the patterns that have been studied, all of them will reverse. It's a special case for Spain, actually. We used it somewhere else and it didn't reverse just for... Anyway, okay, so I want to show you something more about it. So what is this generalized species richness? It's not only species richness. And to show you, it's really using the information about community as well. And to show you this, I get back to our Spanish uh, forest data, and then I create a random, a shuffle data set where uh, I have exactly the same species richness, but I shuffle the species around, so I completely destroy the community composition. So this was our pattern here, but when I do that, so the two data sets have exactly the same species richness. But when I destroy the community composition, as sort of the species pool becomes one throughout the country, I don't see any pattern in the generalized species richness. Um, oh, I see, I still have time, so I'll go through my next two slides, although briefly this is there just because it's, I have one minute? Okay, this says differently, and then I'll be very quick. You can also pick up, because you have information about community composition somehow, you can also pick up if sites are anomalous or they are more typical. And if you only pick up the ones that you call typical, I cannot get in details now into this, and you go back to the original species richness, so this is species richness, the dark dots are of sites that we called, um, that we called typical or not anomalous. I don't know why it's not moving. Ah, now it is. The, um, the, they also linearly decrease with precipitation and increase with temperature. So, sorry for giving this a bit quickly. Um, but, okay, so the generalized species richness combines locally global information, taking species distribution and community assembly patterns into account, and the method identifies patterns that are in the data at, that you can say that they originate in the species pool, and thanks to this method, we could identify a new result, which is that the local woody communities in drier area across Spain are actually species richer, or tend to have speci uh, be species richer than the wetter and, and, uh, hot and colder. And this is bec couldn't be really identified without using this method. Thank you for your attention. I did not even show the equations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one comment I, I noticed. I, mean, I, I like the method, it's an interesting one. But um, with wetlands in Britain, Brian Wheeler's looked at the richness in relation to the productivity or fertility of the soils. In a similar pattern, with the lower fertility soils, you have greater richness. And I'm wondering how much of that might be due to, certainly with plants, greater gaps for you to be able to increase your number of species. But I don't think 
that relationship would happen in the same way with definitely with animals. Uh, so oh, I, yeah. I suspect you'll get the reverse, that yeah. increased productivity will increase greater richness. Yeah, I mean, as I said, when we did this, but I didn't have a good map, so I didn't show it. A student did it with the, f the, um, the American Forest Inventory. You get absolutely the same pattern that you get if you uh, um, upscale the data. It's not that in all cases, it because upscaling, uh, the, the coarse graining is not always wrong. We have always been using it, right? So some in the critical areas, though, you could, uh, you could get, and that's what we show. So yeah, then the Mediterranean areas in Spain is very sp shrub species rich because of that. So that's also what we pick up. That's not, I don't claim that there is a reverse trend in every trend we've yes. been looking. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Far from me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. or in every taxonomic group at all, yeah. Um, any other questions? So um, your method seems like a very effective way of reducing, removing a lot of noise in the data. I'm still, I'm trying to get my head around. What are, what are the properties of a site that has, a, that has been observed to have a lot of species, but is generalized to Yeah, so if a, spe uh, if a site is uh, sort of by chance, s disturbance in previous uh, species reach, but then the generalized species reaches is low, it means that, for example, there are there species like beech tree that normally would live alone, so, or with one other species or few. So the method notices that that's anomalous because in general, in throughout the pattern, those species tend to live alone and it reduces the generalized species richness. Or vice versa, if you are very species poor, but you tend to live always with several neighbors. For example, we observe that actually just, we observe that with beech tree for your case. And for my case with uh, Pinus alepensis, Aleppo pine, that uh, tends to live with the shrub rich uh, normally. But if you observe pines alone, that species rich is gonna grow because potent, you know, it's an average sort of thing. But that's what it looks, it looks at sociability of species. I think we're going to have to cut yeah. it there because we need sure. to move on to the next speaker. We'll be careful. <laughs> Elsa. And then you We've got it up on like the screen. That? Yeah, I think so. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Nice. I'll leave my house. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is Elsa Agemy, and I'm a PhD student in physical geography at Stockholm University in Sweden. And I will talk to you about the choice of diversity metric, species composition and species richness and how the choice of using these metrics influence observed effects of landscape structure. So diversity, we all know about a lot about diversity and we can measure diversity at different levels of detail. We can measure at genetic level or species diversity or ecological or functional diversity. Yeah, sorry, okay, thank you. <laughs> Do everybody hear me? And also we can measure it at a low level of detail, or a high level of detail, or a small spatial scale, or a large spatial scale. And most studies are in with this area. So if you have a quite low, le low level of detail, but a, at a larger spatial scale, your most uh, biographical approach. Um, that's a top-down thinking, and most often we use species richness in these kind of studies. And at this end, we have eco an ecolog ecological approach, uh, bottom-up thinking, and we often include abundance or evenness in our diversity measures. However, it is important to understand how the use of different diversity metrics influence the result. So my main of this, my aim <laughs> of this study is to assess the effect of local and landscape variables on both plant species richness and on species composition. So first I just show you a very nice picture of my study system. So I work in the archipelago. I will come back to that a little bit later. But this is a picture of one of my islands, this big one, 
and also the smaller one surrounding the big island is included in my study. And it's in the ba Baltic archipelago outside of Stockholm in Sweden. And I should tell you that this area is under no tide influence. So I'm really fascinated now when I'm here and looking at the tide. That's very, for me, it's the first time I ever see it. So we don't see it in this area. So why do I work in the archipelago? Well, it's a unique study system. Uh, you have the uniform matrix of water, which is very good when you're working with connectivity and dispersal. It makes it a lot, much uh, easier. And also in this area, you have this isostatic rebound generating land uplift, so I can get the relative age of the islands. And also it's a landscape with a history of fishing and farming. Humans have been in this area for a very long time, influencing the landscape, and that's very interesting. And also it's a very diverse landscape with over 29,000 islands, ranging from very, very small scaries up to quite large islands. So we have an uh, excellent study system when we want to do studies both in time and space. And it's ideal to, to study processes and dynamics in relation, in relation to diversity. So first, one of my main interests is how can we quantify, quantify the landscape? And I work with structural connectivity, and I also want to include fragmentation. I mean, this study system is ideal to study fragmentation and the effects of fragmentation on species diversity. I should mention that I work with plants. <laughs> Maybe I should have told you that in the beginning, but now you know, anyway. <laughs> And I also want to include the species area relationship. I mean, that's a very, very strong relationship, as we all know. Uh, so I have, um, do you say, elaborated structural connectivity measure. Uh, and with this measure, I weight each surrounding island by its distance to the focal island, but also by uh, its proportion of the total connected island area within a specified radius. So by this I get, uh, as I call it, an effective dispersal area. So I get how, how much area is surrounding the focal island that can affect this focal island by dispersal from different <coughs> species or working as stepping stones. So if you want to read more about this, you can look in this very nice paper. And then I also want to measure diversity, and I mainly work with, uh, in this paper, richness and composition. And just to be clear what I mean with composition uh, and richness, when I'm talking about richness, it's just the number of species present on each child and no information about the identity. But on the other hand, when I'm talking about species composition, I include the identity of the species, but I don't include any abundance. So it's only presence absent data. So I have the same data set from the same islands, from the same inventory. But on one hand, I use only the species number, species richness, and on the other hand, I use the species identity, excluding abundance. So once again, my study area, it's situated in the outer archipelago of Stockholm. You have Stockholm in here. Um, it's 112 islands, and as I said, it's presence absence data for plant species. And uh, these islands are divided into 12 different island landscapes, as I call them. So this is not just one island, it consists of many islands. But that's quite hard to see on this map. And uh, they range from 0 0.02 hectare up to 54 hectares, so they are quite diverse in their uh, range of, in area. And also I found between six and 199 plant species per island, and a total of 354 plant species. So it's, it's quite many plant species actually when you're working in the outer archipelago. I was a bit surprised about that. So I use a biogeographical approach. Uh, I include island area, of course, and uh, island height as a um, measure of the relative age of the islands, and also distance to mainland and my structural connectivity measure. And as I told you maybe 10 times now, I compare species richness and composition. And just here is a picture, a, a 3D 
profile from one of my islands, just to illustrate how this uh, land uplift uh, influenced the landscape in this area. So if you lower the island by one meter, then you lose quite a lot of island area. So just to give you an idea. Just a quick reminder, I don't think I need to say this, but I do it anyway. <laughs> I want to assess the effect of local and landscape variables on both richness and composition. So just some uh, results. First, I only look at species richness. Each dot is one island, and here you have island area, species richness, and distance to mainland. And as you can see, there is a positive relationship between species richness and island area, not surprising. Mm -hmm and also a negative relationship between species, species richness and distance to mainland, not surprising either. Then I looked at the smaller islands with an area less than 0 0.5 hectare, and then it was only the island area that was significant, nothing else uh, explained the species richness on the island. However, when I'm looking at the species composition, I can see that all my explaining variables are significant, uh, once again, each dot is the species composition per island. And looking at the smaller islands, oh, it's a much nicer graph, yeah. But it's the same when I look, uh, look at the smaller islands, uh, the um, results is the same. So is there a difference depending on if I use only species richness or if I include the species identity? Yes, there is a different difference. And it's, it's a quite um, big difference, I think. Uh, you see a much more complicated pattern when you include species composition, even though I don't include any abundance information or evenness, it's just the species identity. And most often if you have species richness, you also have this species identity. So my results, yes, um, island area is the strongest pred predictor for species richness. And when I look at the species composition, I can clearly see that the surrounding landscape is of importance for what species you find on the islands. And a more complex pattern is revealed when I include species composition. So my conclusions is that the interpretation of landscapes effect can vary depending on metrics used. And this can in turn affect our understanding for ecological relationships. And in the long run, this can influence decision making and conservation efforts. And this might seem um, quite basic, but many, many, many studies only use species richness. And I argue that, as I said, if you have species richness, you most often also have this species identity. So it might be a good uh, thing to do to include species composition because then you get a better idea how your study system works uh, and what can influence the species presence or absence. Yes, thank you for listening and thank you to all my people helping me and all the people giving me money to do this. So thank you. Yeah. Yes. And what you need is a statistical method, method for taking apart these different information or components in your data. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, this is just a first study, and I will, of course, do more. But my um, aim here was to reveal, because I read a lot of papers, as we all have done. Oh, sorry, all, we all have done, of course. And I was like, OK, most papers I've read is about species richness. But I mean, there are so much more, and as you said, there are numbers of different diversity measures. And um, yeah, okay, yeah. So I mean, I mean, and that might also be a problem. Depends on how you see it, but you really need to know what is my question and what measure should I use to answer that question, and not just t pick one. So you really have to be careful and think about what measure to use. I think. 
of course. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> are, there, are there any particular statistical methods for separating those out? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that hasn't implied that anybody does them. <laughs> I don't agree with you. Yeah. Any other questions? No. I'll leave. Thank you. I'll oh. How much influence does wave action or ice oh, that's push a in winter? Good question, actually. And I haven't studied that. But of course, there is influence mainly on the seashore and the seashore species. And I've been looking at the seashore vegetation also. And I can see that it is a unique flora in the seashore vegetation, of course. So I'm sure, but I, I guess most of the species that you find in the seashore, they are. Um, I have to unpass it. Yeah. No, 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 they aren't actually. I mean, you, f you find some adapted. unique, sorry, adapted, thank you, that's the word. They are adapted to that kind of environment and that disturbance, yeah. yeah so, yes. But you find unique species in the seashore, you do. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that's a yes, unique I study. I would imagine that sort of variable would have a greater influence on smaller islands. Uh, it depends on, I mean, the smaller islands, they are almost barely a rock. And then you have vegetation in these small, um, yeah, exactly, small cracks. And that is not necessary right by the water. I mean, it can be in the middle of the island. So it doesn't have to be like that, actually. No. Okay. Yeah. Right, well, we'll move on to the next speaker. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Sarah from the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, and she'll be talking about sea desiccation sensitivity, estimating the global incidence of the regeneration trait and predictive modelling. If I can find my talk, I'm getting there. Bear with. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Yes, I'm Sarah from the Robin Hannah Gardens Q. Um, I'll be talking to you about some work we've been doing at the Millennium Seed Bank uh, about desiccation sensitive seeds. So, seeds. Um, we can broadly divide them into two categories those that can tolerate water loss and those that can't. Um, so, species that survive water loss we call desiccation tolerant, imaginatively, um, or orthodox in sort of seed banking uh, sort of parlance. And these species are shed, um, sort of undergo prematuration drying, um, so they're shed with quite low water contents and they can undergo further, further water loss. Um, and these are the species that are sort of most common in, uh, in seasonal environments and you know, can wait out a, a drought or a um, cold winter or what have you to germinate at um, sort of more appropriate time. In contrast, we've got our desiccation sensitive seeds. Um, these are far less common, far fewer species um, globally with, with this trait. And these species are shed with um, very high water contents and they're shed metabolically active. Um, and yeah, so water loss is, is lethal to these seeds. It's uh, sort of a highly sort of competitive strategy for, for plants um, growing in sort of moist tropical rainforest, um, sort of mature phase trees that they can germinate very rapidly. Um, form sort of seedling banks that are ready to sort of take advantage swiftly of, of a light gap or something if it arises. And importantly for us at, at the seed bank, you can't dry these species out, so you can't freeze them uh, or you get ice formation. So we can't store these seeds um, in ex situ in a seed bank uh, for conservation purposes. These seeds are also um, quite sensitive to environmental, potentially to environmental change. Uh, if you have increasing drought, potentially under climate change, you, you might be, these guys might be facing a bit of a problem. So we had two, two aims. The first one is to um, try and get an unbiased sort of estimate of just how many of the world's seed plants um, have, have this trait. And secondly, then to develop a model to help us predict uh, the probability that a particular individual species that we don't 
uh, know about uh, actually has, has this uh, desiccation sensitive trait. So how many desiccation sensitive sea plants are, are there? Um, there are many different estimates in the literature. These usually range from around 7 to about 25% of the world's sea plants. I have seen one as high as 50%, which I think was not quite sure what's going on there. Um, but yeah, we don't really, don't really know. Uh, within Kew's seed information database, we've got information about 19,000 taxa, and about 3% of these are desiccation sensitive, but we know this is a biased sample, um, biased towards the desiccation tolerant species. So we've got a sort of a binary trait, desiccation sensitive versus desiccation tolerant. Uh, we know it's related to taxonomy. Um, and these nice people, Fitzjohn, Pennell, et al. in 2014, came up with quite a good method um, of estimating sort of doing an unbiased prediction um, of a sort of binary, the incidence of a binary trait with respect to how much um, proportion of the world's plants that, uh, that are woody. So we use their methods. And so this method is um, sort of imputing the values of all species with that, that we don't have a known value for. Uh, so we use the plant list as a, to get our sort of species list of all, of all sea plants. We imputed the values of unknown species using the, um, basically the, the known values of, of their relatives. We did this using two models, a hypergeometric model, um, which is sort of represents a case of sampling without replacement, and a binomial model, uh, which is sampling with replacement. We then repeated these, um, using the values of, not instead of co um, congeners, values of species from the same habitat, because we know that the, the incidence of this trait is strongly relates to a species habitat. And what did we find? So we had four, so four models in total. Uh, we did 100 iterations of each model. And up the top up here, we've got the, um, the mean estimated proportion of all sea plants with, uh, with this trait. And three of our models are um, happily producing a quite a similar result, around about 8%. One of our models is, is telling us a bit of a different story, but we can explain that, uh, which is what we, we like to hear. Um, so if you look at this figure over here, this is the seed information database data, looking at the proportion of desiccation sensitive species per genus. So all, of all the species we know about within the genus, how many have, uh, have each trait? And you can see it's pretty, uh, it's pretty binary. They're either desiccation tolerant, as we know mo most of these genera are fall in this category, or they're desiccation sensitive. There's not much going on in the middle there. And our binomial model for the sort of taxonomy-based model produces a similar sort of pattern, whereas this hypergeometric model is sort of inflating down this area here which is causing those higher, um, higher percentages. So where we have a genus with all one trait value, it's throwing in a few, um, sort of imputing a few species with the other trait value, whereas the binary model is just sticking with, with that, um, that dominant trait value. So we can conclude from this, from this study that it's likely about 8% of sea plants have this desiccation sensitive trait. There are also some patterns with this. So most of them are woody. By far away, the vast majority of these species are, are woody plants. There are a few herbaceous species that are all, um, all perennial, but um, yeah, very few. The mature phase forest trees, um, and mostly they're occurring within, within the wet tropics. The trade also occurs throughout the phylogeny. So it's we've got monocots, eudicots, magnolids, gymnosperms, but it is strongly conserved at low taxonomic levels. So we can use all of these um, different relationships to then try and predict um, for an unknown species what's the likelihood that it's going to produce, that it's going to sort of possess this trait. Which brings me to, to my, second, um, it's my second aim. So we, thank you, so we um, compiled a, a database from um, existing literature for, for existing data, freely available. Um, <laughs> most of it came from Kew's Seed Information Database, which is publicly available, I like to point out. Um, got some from a recent paper by Zana et al. in Nature about uh, woodiness. And we also tried to get a, a measure of the, uh, the environment of 
it's the habitat of each species using uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility to get an idea of what the distributions of the species and then um, World CLIM for the, uh, for the climate variables at those locations. So we've got our predictive variables, we've got climate, we've got woodiness, we've got seed traits. We can also produce a, a, a measure, a, va a value that represents the proportion of, proportion of species relatives with this desiccation sensitive trait. Now these relatives might be congeners, they might be confamilial species or some species you might only know about uh, species within the same order. And you expect that you're going to get a different, different pattern, a different relationship, um, depending on whether you know about congeners or whether you know about species in the same order. So where we could, we produced three versions of this variable. Uh, one's based on members of the same, uh, the, re the proportion of relatives within the same order that um, have the trait, one for the same family, and then one just for species within the same order. So genus, family, order three models. Uh, and we, we use boosted regression trees for, to produce our models, which is a machine learning technique. Uh, I won't go into it in detail, but I can point to some good papers if anyone is particularly interested. So what do we find? Uh, the key thing I want you to get from this figure, we've, we've got one fig three figures, one for each model, showing the relative importance of each of those predictive variables. What you can see is that the proportion of desiccation sensitive relatives of species is by far away sort of the most important predictor for the, our genus level model and our family level model. The genus level one, that's basically all you need to know. These, these other variables don't really, don't really do much. If you know what relatives are doing, you're, you're pretty much there. Uh, for the family level model, the other variables, seed mass um, and precipitation variables start becoming important. But for our order level model, if you only know about relatives that were in the same order as your species of interest, you really need all these other variables um, doing a job in the model as well. Seed mass, most important. Precipitation, woodiness comes in there. Um, and whereas other things including dis dispersal mode of the seed. So the key thing is do the models work? And I think they kind of do, uh, so that's good. So we, uh, we tested this, we did um, 100 iterations of 10-fold cross-validation where we um, had a sort of separated test set of species, developed a model based on the training data set, then imputed the, then um, predicted the values for our test species and checked to see if we were right. Now if you look at all species, it's, um, it's pretty jolly good, but remember we've got 3% of our data set are desiccation sensitive. So if we said everything was orthodox, was desiccation tolerant, you'd be right 97% of the time. So the thing to look at here is how well is this model performing for those few desiccation sensitive species. This, the genus level model, if we know about relatives within the same genus, then we can successfully predict what's going on about 90% of the time. Family level, about 80% of the time. Uh, order level, we're we're getting down to only about 60%. So you really do need to be having as much information as you can about, um, about related species. Thanks. We then sort of started pulling out variables from the test set to see what would happen if we didn't really know much at all, any other, any other variables. Um, and for, for the genus and family level models, if, only you, if you only knew about you know, what the species was called, you still did pretty well. So genus level model, you're right, about 80% of the time. Family level model, about 70% of the time. But for the order level model, as we saw, you need those other variables in there. Uh, Remove seed mass is about 50%, but anything else and the whole thing kind of fell apart um, and you couldn't really uh, do much predicting at all. So to conclude, we say that about 88% of seed plants likely to produce, or likely have um, desiccation sensitive seed traits, producing recalcitrant desiccation sensitive seeds. This trait is related to habitat and to taxonomy. And we can use, use these relationships and then try and use existing data to predict an unknown species, what, how it's likely to behave. And this is useful. Uh, we, we do actually want to know, want to be able to do this. We're using this already within the Millennium Seed Bank uh, sort of for informing our collection strategy and providing decision making support. So if someone comes to me and says, Sarah, I've got a list of species for Thailand, where should I start? Which ones should I prioritise my collecting for? Which ones we most likely to be able to store? we can send them away with a good idea of where they should start, what they should uh, focus on. 
You also might be thinking about habitat restoration in a tropical environment. How are you going to go about you know, regenerating the species, propagating them, that sort of thing. And finally, it might be able to help us identify some species that we might, might be most vulnerable to the change in climates, might be, have least resilience um, to increasing levels of drought and things like that. So finally, thanks to these lovely people and thanks to you guys for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Two scary equations. The old, it struck I've me in the order level. Yeah. You know better than a bit tossing a coin, isn't it? Yeah. If you don't have sea bass, mm. presumably, yeah. Yeah. it's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, you're going to need to try and, yeah, we, we need data basically. Yeah. That's the key thing. Yeah. Well, if there are Ready? Here's Thomas Etherington from again. Yeah, thank you. It's the Q. It's the Q. Q. Hold <laughs> on. Right. Um, just close Yours is not just close. Just close that. Is that yours? That's me, yeah. Hello everyone. So uh, yeah, my name is Tom Etherington. I'm from Q as well. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, distance. Um, people have been using distance in quite a few talks uh, through the conference so far. And Elsa had another really good example in this session even about trying to understand ecological patterns and processes and how distance between communities might control and affect that. Um, and Elsa was working on islands and um, you totally understand how distance in that context makes um, a lot of sense because you have sort of a uniform you know, um, environment in between those islands. Um, but I tend to work mostly in terrestrial systems and I don't think it, the situation is necessarily as simple as that. So I'm going to talk about least cost modelling as a method to perhaps try and get a more I don't know, nuanced or better idea about the distance in a sort of more ecologically meaningful way between locations you might be interested in. So first of all, I was going to try and um, convince you that that's a sort of relevant thing to think about. Um, so if you were, um, and you don't always have to, you, distance would still work in a terrestrial context some of the time. So take, for instance, I've got a couple of different landscape pictures here. Um, so imagine you, and this stuff is always species-specific, species so imagine you as a human um, standing where I took these photos. The top landscape, um, from a human perspective, that might be considered pretty homogenous. Um, I would certainly consider it pretty homogenous. All looks the same to me, just big, long blanket bog. Um, so in that context, you probably could measure sort of the connectivity, the connection, the ecological distance across that landscape as just distance in metres, at least from a human perspective, because the environment is you know, pretty much the same. But there are many landscapes in the world, such as the picture at the bottom there, um, where, again, from a human's perspective, um, your ability to... Um, move through that landscape is going to vary dramatically. Okay, I one for one, I'm a very lazy sort of person, so if I have to move through this landscape, I'm not going to be scaling mountains, I'm going to make a very quick and immediate choice to stick on the flat bits. Okay, um, and that's going to affect my sort of distance between places because I'm not going to be able to go straight over the mountains, I'm probably going to go around the mountains. Therefore, the straight line distance to crow flies might not be a particularly relevant way of trying to measure distance in that context. And I think we can probably make a similar sort of, again, that's me as a human, but I think we can probably make some guesses straight away that animals or e organisms might behave in a similar sort of way, that there will be some fairly generic and simple rules that we might be able to incorporate into our analyses to try and build a sort of more nuanced idea of how distant things are. So a um, method that I've used quite a bit um, is called least cost modelling. I'm just going to do a quick run through of the method for those people who aren't familiar with it. Uh, it's quite simple. It's in, it, you can find it in most GIS um, packages nowadays. Um, um, so it's quite accessible, I would say. So the basic process is we have a landscape. Um, so this is sort of in the um, Canadian Rockies. Um, but we need to simplify things initially just to be able to feed that information into a computer to be able to analyse it. So first things first, we sort of um, uh, rasterise it, say. Um, and 
I, sh I, should, I should pause myself here and just note that um, this process of creating um, or simplifying the landscape, this is the trickiest bit of the process. This is the bit where it becomes the most like sort of black magic in terms of how you go about simplifying things. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to brush over that completely, okay? Because to get into that's like a whole other sort of talk. Um, but I'll come back to it at the end of the talk. So, um, so hypothetically, we could um, rasterize our landscapes. We end up with sort of like a pixelized grid on the right-hand side there. Um, we pick out categories that we think are, again, relevant for the species that we're specifically interested in trying to um, model. So here I've got forest, grass, rock, and water. And then magically, we decide how much those, um, the cost for movement across those different type of landscape types. Um, that cost could be a, a variety of things. So, I mean, the, the, the technique was founded in sort of um, transport geography, really. So they were talking about cost literally in terms of money. Um, but we can talk here in terms of ecological costs. So that could be um, energetic, you know, uh, calories burned. It could be some sort of psychological aversion to going, you know, across certain habitat types. So it could be mortality cost, the, the possibility of just being predated or killed, okay? But some sort of cost that insta sort of identifies which bits of the landscape are easier or harder to move across. Um, and then we come to the actual algorithm thing. Um, so again, just going back to this idea about um, straight line distance. So we have a, a starting point here, this yellow dot in the middle of my landscape. And we've got a, a, a set of three um, end points, these white dots around the outside. They're all um, equally distant away. So they're all 16 kilometers away. So if we were to sort of ignore landscape and just assume that distance on its own was an appropriate measure of ecological connectivity, ecological distance, we would consider each three of those points to be as distant from the starting point because they're all 16 kilometers away. But um, I've obviously produced this example to prove my point or demonstrate my point. Um, if we can then feed information about the costs of the landscape, so you've got your um, low costs through to your high cost um, location. And indeed, you can have locations that you say are completely impermeable for the organism that you're interested in. Um, then you can ask, a, ask the computer then process um, the data and find out um, what's the, the least cost path between a starting location and these ending locations. And these are the red lines here. So the computer basically just looks at all possible combinations and picks out the least cost path, which balances um, the distance traversed, uh, the distance moved and the costs traversed. Okay, so it balances those two out. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. The key thing to look at really is um, that when you look at things in terms of the least cost path, um, the, the distance between locations is quite different. So the, um, the, the units uh, sort of, well, I could say they're meaningless. They're, they're, they're an abstract sort of units. So you have to think in relative terms in this context. But um, the, the distance to move out here is 16 times 10 to the 3, 32, and 57. So although they're equally distant in terms of straight line kilometers, um, the, the ecological cost, assuming that you know, these are actually true or at least meaningful, we can see that this point down here is, is much closer than these other two points. And this point is actually very distant by comparison. The way the computer d does that least cost calculation um, is actually very, very simple. Um, basically, if we have, um, imagine these points along here constitute a least cost path, all we do is look at the, um, the costs in cell A and B, so that's the cost in A and B, divide that by two and multiply it by the distance between those two cells. And similarly, same thing along here. So, um, and the least cost path is basically the accumulation of all these individual steps. So each step between a pixel has a cost distance associated with it, and the computer can figure out the most efficient route of minimizing the distance that you move and the costs that you traverse. Um, so yeah, so I've used this quite a bit, so I'll try and give an example of how that can be useful in ecological context. So here we've got brush tail possums, and I was interested in dispersal um, of those. Um, this was a landscape genetics study. Um, so here you've got a landscape. This is where possums um, were um, <laughs> killed. Um, and they're, they're an invasive species, I should note. Um, so as part of an invasive species eradication program, um, possums were killed and they donated their genetic information to science. Um, but if we look at how um, the genetic distance varies between those populations as a function of straight line distance, there isn't much of a pattern. Yes, the more distant you are in terms of straight line distance, um, the less related you are, but there's not really a strong and clear pattern, thanks. So we did some, and again, I don't have time to dip into this, but um, did some work trying to develop, um, view it from uh, a least cost sort of perspective. Um, 
we've developed a very simple model that basically just says rivers are hard to cross and possums like going through trees. And just a simple model like that, we could actually shift um, the amount of genetic um, differentiation in the population. We could actually explain well over a third of that, which is actually pretty good for these sorts of studies. And that was really simple. So that's just rivers and trees. And we can produce a much more um, nuanced idea of how connected a landscape is, or how distant things on a landscape are from the perspective of a brush-tailed possum. Um, that has various sort of useful um, applications in ecology. So returning to the brush-tailed possums in the right-hand side, so they're a terrible invasive species in, um, in New Zealand. There was actually a picture of a possum in um, uh, Wayne's talk at the beginning of the, um, the session. Um, so if we found areas that we thought were um, too close in an ecological context, perhaps we could <laughs> do some things to increase the cost of the landscape to try and prevent invasive species moving around. So you could do that structurally by building these jolly great big fences, which they're keen on doing in New Zealand, um, or you could, so you could mess around with the structural uh, connectivity, the structural costs, or the functional costs, so you could you know, have trapping on a landscape. So you could actually increase, say, the mortality um, cost of moving through certain parts of the landscape. Similarly, in other parts of the world, so this is grizzly bears in uh, North America, um, there you might be looking at reducing um, costs of traversal by putting in, say, um, overpasses over main highways, so you reduce the uh, mortality costs for crossing those roads, or even potentially translocations. If, if, some, if two locations you think are so utterly distant from a grizzly bear's perspective, the only way you can have population persistence is actually to reduce the cost by translocating them. But uh, it's a method that sort of gives you an indication of you know, um, how distant things are. But um, the, the key thing I wanted to mention today is, and people are using that a lot, there's lots and lots of studies on, that are using least cost modelling. But I guess my argument is that I'm not sure necessarily how ecologically realistic some of these models are. And there are actually some very simple things that as ecologists we could be doing to try and make our, 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 our least cost modelling more um, realistic. Um, so here's the same landscape I showed you at the beginning. So we've just got a, a starting point in the middle, and this surface just shows... Uh, the least cost distance sort of radiating out from that central location. Um, okay, so the first thing we might be concerned about is um, in um, is elevation. So um, we're looking at topographic distances. So essentially, we're saying that if you if you're having to go up and down slopes a lot, you're actually covering greater distance than if you just went straight line distance between two locations. So we can build that in very easily. So normally, you'd, the distance you would multiply your cost by would be this orange line along here, but actually, because you're moving up slope here, say, you're actually covering a much longer distance than just along the straight line. Um, and that actually makes, if you incorporate that, that can make a little bit of a difference. Um, the colours aren't coming out as well on the screen, I'm afraid, but let's, I'll draw your attention to this position here. So if we include that, this orange area actually retracts slightly down, so th these areas actually become more distant to get to if we recognise that actually, the actual metres that someone's, what an organism is moving is actually increasing. So that's one thing. Second one is looking at vertical scaling. Archaeologists are all over this. Um, they, they well recognise that you know, it's much easier to walk um, down a 10 degree slope than it is to walk up a 10 degree slope. So slope varies across the landscape and you can sort of um, create a, uh, a model to demonstrate this. So here where you've got, whoops, the button's finished. Where you've got a slope of zero, you multiply the costs by one. Okay, so if you slope, multiply by one, there's no difference, doesn't make any difference. But as you start going up increasingly um, steeper slopes, the multiplying distance becomes larger and larger. So you can incorporate that fact that it costs more energy to go up a slope than down a slope. Thanks. And again, that makes a difference. The final one I was going to talk about, oh, I should say um, about that. Um, if you look in the literature, you can actually find that there are these strange eco-physiology type of people who put animals on treadmills and then measure their respiration and stuff. So there is actually data out there that could be used to, to, to calibrate that sort of a, a function. Uh, the final one is basically to do with um, other factors. So you could have wind or water that could also affect um, uh, the costs. So in this instance, we're not worried about the middle bit because I'm running out of time. Um, but if you imagine you had a prevailing wind that was coming from left to right across the screen, you can incorporate that sort of information as well. So if you've got insects that are likely to disperse through flight, say, like ants or something, if they've got a dispersal flight phase. You can incorporate that sort of information as well. And again, you can see it makes quite a big difference in terms of how distant you think things are. It becomes more distant um, if you go against the wind and um, less distant when you go with the wind. Um, shameless advertising. I've written a paper on this that covers the few things I mentioned plus a whole lot more. Um, so if you're interested in the technique, 
I'll start there. And happy to answer questions and talk over lunch as well. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Uh, it's good to see the inclusion of uh, photography in this because the one we have seen in the past has only been the cost distance. But how are you addressing the issue with actually assigning those costs uh, above and beyond some sort of Delphi or Pini? Okay, that was the whole black magic thing that I was just skip, skipping over wildly. Um, see my publish work, I guess, would be the first thing I would suggest. I mean, there are ways and techniques of working through that. I mean, for the possum example that I showed, um, we essentially um, uh, identified things that we thought would be important based on what we knew about the species, and then just looked at a whole wide range of possible different costs and combination of those costs, and looked at the fit between the genetic data and the least cost distance and picked out the model that worked best. So that's how I've gone about things in the past. And, but there are lots of other techniques as well. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. One of the problems with this kind of analysis is that the organisms don't have the perfect knowledge of their environment that the computer has. Yes. Are there any attempts to build in this kind of imperfect knowledge into the, the model? Uh, yes. I mean, what I would say in that context, um, so, you know, um, yes, um, least cost modelling is one extreme. Essentially, the technique assumes the organism has perfect knowledge of the landscape and chooses the optimum route, which is not going to be true. There are other methods like circuit theory, if you're familiar with that. Um, they, can, they adopt the complete opposite view, and the organism has no knowledge of the landscape and walks around randomly, essentially. Truth is somewhere in the middle, I would say. So often I would suggest perhaps a different technique is a good way to go, or there is also... Um, people doing work with um, agent-based modeling that incorporate cost um, of movement as part of that process, but then you can incorporate things like perceptual range and some sort of decision-making as part of that process. So it's, it's just one of many tools that, that can be used, I guess would be my, my answer. Yeah. Right, we'll have the next speaker, please. Thanks, okay. Thanks Tom. Uh, and it's uh, Tom August. Yes, he's, it's, um, I think some batteries gone on it. And he'll be talking about supporting reproducible and shareable species distribution modeling with Zoom. Great, thank you very much. So I'm uh, Tom August, I'm from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And I'm going to talk to you about a tool today called Zoom, which me and others have been working on for a couple of years. And the idea behind Zoom is to create an R tool that makes species distribution, species distribution modeling uh, more re reproducible and easier to do well. Um, there's lots of people involved in this project. I'm going to put up all their pictures at the end. I couldn't fit all their names on my first slide. So species distribution modelling, you're probably all fairly familiar with it, but very briefly, it's where we use occurrence data uh, of species and covariate data such as habitat and climate to help understand the niche space that species occupy and then predict, predict perhaps through time or through space where species might occur. It's a very popular method. Uh, the influential papers in SDM literature are very uh, highly cited. And you can see in the top left here um, a few of the uh, most influential papers uh, in the SDM literature and how they've been increasing their citations over time. There's also, uh, as a consequence, lots of different methods uh, for doing species distribution modelling both in terms of the models, uh, how you might ag add background points, how you might assess models, uh, and they exist in a variety of language, predominantly R. Uh, some of them are R packages, some of them are snippets of code in various people's uh, hard drives. Um, so there's lots of stuff out there, uh, and there's been reviews, so this paper down, uh, this graph down the bottom right hand side is a graph from Jane Edith's paper in 2006, um, one of the most highly cited papers in, in the SDM literature, where she and others compared a whole range of different uh, methods, different models, uh, and, uh, and compared them to one another and how well they performed using uh, benchmark data sets. So it's a really fantastic paper, but one of the problems with it is that it's not reproducible. So we don't have uh, open access to the data that was used, and we don't have the code that was used uh, to run the models. So as a consequence, when a new model is created, we can't slot that into the same analysis and benchmark it against those models. And that's really what we need to understand how well new models perform uh, and to judge them uh, and benchmark them as they appear in the literature. So that's what we're trying to do with Zoom. We're trying to make this, this whole process a bit 
bit more simple uh, and, uh, and reproducible. So it's a framework, it's just an R package, and it's an online repository of code snippets. And I'm gonna go through that in a bit more detail. The consequences of this, we hope, is lots of ubbles, okay? It's discoverable, shareable, modifiable, extensible, and ubbles are usually quite good. So hopefully we're, we're doing a good thing. We break down the SDM workflow into five different modules, okay, five different steps. So the first two are your data, your occurrence data, so your observations of your species, and your covariate data, your habitat data, your raster data, your, your bioclim data, perhaps. The data from these two modules then flow into a third module, your process module. So this might be adding background points, or adding cross-validation folds, that sort of thing. The fourth is your model, so that may, might be something from Biomod or Maxent or any of the uh, many mo models that are available. And then finally it goes into an output model and this can be your uh, performance measures or it could be uh, some plotting, uh, anything you like really, some sort of summarization. So I don't have, my, I don't have a pointer because it ran out of batteries. Oh, here it comes. Um, so this is what it looks like in R. I thought I'd put this up early on so that you still actually get an idea of what I'm talking about. Cheers. Um, so this is what the workflow, it's basically, there's basically one key function that's workflow, and into it goes these five different modules. So occurrence, covariate, process, model, and output, which I just outlined. And in this example, we're gonna use some occurrence data of mosquitoes, uh, some covariate data from Bioclim. We're gonna add 100 background points, do a logistic regression, and create an interactive map. So those modules, the results from one just flow into another. So these modules have standardized inputs and outputs, and anyone can contribute these modules to Zoom, to the online repository, okay? So it's a lower bar than perhaps creating an R package and submitting it to CRAN. So this thing's run, and in this case, we're just showing off the, the interactive map, map feature, which uses Leaflet to sort of show your, your predicted layer, and on top here, we've got the, um, the occurrence points. So if that gives you a bit of a flavor of what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go through just a few examples, um, which I hope highlight where, where I think the real strength of Zoom is. Uh, the first is in replication. So replicating studies, but perhaps more importantly, allowing other people to replicate your, your work, which is clearly becoming a growing demand of journals when publishing that code and things be made more available. And Zoom would really make that process incredibly easy for you as an author. So here in this paper, um, Feng and Papes, they looked at the nine-banded armadillo and they were uh, modeling the distribution in the Americas, particularly f uh, focusing in, uh, in North America, in the United States. So I've sort of broken, broken down their methodology into our modules so you can see how those two, two match onto one another. So their occurrence data came from GBIF and a search in the literature. Uh, we have a module for getting data from GBIF. It's just a wrapper around an, an, an existing R package. Uh, their data from the literature wasn't accessible, so I, I didn't have that. They used nine layers from Bioclim. We've got a Bioclim uh, module. Again, just a wrap around an existing R package, so I can get those in, no problem. Uh, they had a few different processing steps, added background points in a 200 kilometer buffer, and used this method. Uh, we have modules for those. They used Maxent, and then they did some visualizations using a, a threshold in, in the USA. So if we write that in Zoom parlance, it just looks like this. So our current module gets the species data from uh, GBIF. We get the covariate data from Bioclim. The process is, a, is actually a few different steps. So they get chained together, these steps. So first it runs this step, then the next step, and so on, uh, and so on. So uh, my results look uh, something like this. And this is the result from their paper. Um, there's not a perfect match. So as I said, we didn't have the data that they used from the literature. So that could explain the differences. So some differences down here, for example. Um, but all in all, it was, uh, it was a fairly good match, I thought. Another really good strength of, of Zoom, I think, is in dissemination. So if you have written a paper or done some work and you've created a new method, that could be, it could be a new data set. It could be a new occurrence data set. It could be a new covariate data set, or it could be a new model. Then you can write that quite easily as a Zoom module and share it and get other people to use it and get credit for them using it. 
And we like to think that, that, that the bar of doing that is much lower than submitting it to CRAN, which is probably current, current good practice. So here I, I just picked up this method from the literature, spatial thinning. This is a way of thinning your occurrence uh, points to try and remove some bias. So if you have uh, some points here, for example, where they're really clustered in one area, the method reduces the purple points, just leaving behind the red points um, to try and remove bias there. Uh, this is already published as, a, as an R package. So this was uh, nice and easy for me. Uh, all I had to do was uh, write this little function. So modules are just functions. It takes defined inputs and returns defined outputs. Uh, I do a little bit of uh, messing around with the data that comes in to get it into the format that spatial thinning uh, package, package expects. I then run the spatial thinning, and then I uh, reformat it into this uh, format that Zoom expects to come out. So as easy as that. So if you have your code, your, function, your, your method already written as a function, it's really quite trivial uh, to rewrite it as a Zoom module. Uh, that can then be shared. So we have a prototype website uh, which has all of the modules, the, the color coded here according to the module, if they're a current data, or the model, or the process. And you can explore the, uh, the data there about how they work. You can go and look at the code, see how they function. If you think you can make them better, you can uh, download them, uh, up, improve them, upload a new version. And we've got a lot of stuff up there already. So a lot of the common stuff uh, that you might expect is up there. So as I said, BioClim, Biomod, uh, NCEP data, uh, and various performance metrics. Uh, one of the applications I'm most excited about is in um, model comparison. So for example, here, uh, there was a uh, maximum likelihood method um, proposed. And in this paper, they compared it to uh, Maxent and suggested that the, the maximum likelihood method was better. Um, this resulted in a, a then ongoing discussion over the next year in a series of papers as to whether that was true and in what cases that was true. Uh, and they did various uh, different comparisons, different data sets, and looking at a few different models. Uh, I think this could perhaps have been uh, done better in Zoom. Well, I would say that. Uh, but hopefully, I'll demonstrate why I think that's the case. So in Zoom, one, one of the things you can do is to, to create a list. So imagine our, our workflow. We've got our occurrence data and our covariate data. They've mm -hmm. flowed into the process data. What I can then do is what we call a list. So I branch that analysis into a series of different models. Those then all flow into the output model. So I've created this list, the list creates a fork in the road, and that then allows me to compare the outputs from all those three models. Listing can be done at any stage. So if you wanted to compare data sets or uh, you know, current data sets or you know, different ways of selecting background points, you could do that too. So the bit of code that's important is here. I've got this little list, and then I've listed the three models that I want to uh, compare. The rest of this is the entire workflow bit of script here. This bit down here is just summarizing the output to display. Um, so when I run that, it's going to get the occurrence data, get the covariate data, add the background points, and then in parallel run the three different models. Um, output, I sped that up, by the way. Uh, that's not how fast it actually ran. Uh, we get the summary statistics of those models, so I can compare them against one another. And I get their predicted uh, maps as well, so I can compare those two. Now, I listed three models, but this is infinitely scalable. I could have listed 100 models in there. So I could use benchmarking data sets to compare all the models that are available in Zoom. And that's sort of where we want to go next. So the next step for us is to build a big community. Uh, and we've got some funding with our open science uh, to get some people on board to do this. So to have sort of discussion forums where people can chat about what perhaps the best methods are. We can use benchmarking to see which models perform uh, best and in which situations they might perform better than one another. And then you know, look at different ways in which you might uh, measure how well, they, how well they, uh, they fit the data. And also have some sort of guidance literature as well. So um, we've already started putting some of these together. So uh, perhaps you know, targeted at students, early career researchers, um, about good practice in species distribution modeling, backed up with reproducible examples uh, using Zoom. So that just leads me to say a big thank you to everyone who's been involved in Zoom. I'm sort of the lead developer on the, on the R side of stuff. Uh, my background's not in species distribution modeling, but we had a lot of uh, in, uh, input from a whole range of people um, who contributed to, to, taking, uh, to, to creating Zoom as you see it now. 
Um, all the code uh, for, for the Zoom package is, is here on GitHub. It's also on CRAN as a package. And all the modules uh, are available uh, there on this uh, repository here. We're writing a paper, which is hopefully gonna, we're going to submit in, uh, early in the next year. That's also on GitHub, which is just a really nerdy thing to do. It's, it's quite impractical, I would say. But if you want to go and look at the paper as it's being written with all its blemishes, uh, it's up here. Please don't judge us too much. Uh, and we've got funding from a whole range of sources and support from a whole bunch of different institutions. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, there are basic quality checks. So there's a whole series of checks that, that sh ensure that you know, it actually outputs something intelligible to Zoom and that sort of stuff. But in terms of uh, is it sci of good scientific merit, um, we hope that through the benchmarking and having a sort of, with, we're considering a sort of you know, Amazon style rating system or something like that. So there's like a, a peer review, community review process so that the, the modules which are are perceived to be good, good practice, um, valuable scientifically, will sort of move to the top and that'll be, that'll be displayed in that way. So hopefully it'll be quite an organic sort of community process, yeah. Maybe one quick Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, it would be in it would be in memory. So you're going to have. I should also say when you, when you run a, a workflow, the objects that returned has all the data in it. So that so the the, the objects that returned can be given to anyone, and they can entirely replicate your analysis. That comes with the burden of a lot of data potentially if you're dealing with sort of global bioclim layers. So we're ad we're adding functionality to allow you to remove that data to make it a bit easier to move things around. And yes, if you were going to do uh, all, you know, all models that were available on Zoom, you'd probably want to have a HPC cluster or something to do it on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. We must move on. Thank you. Uh, Alan James from the University of Sheffield. Right, uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Alan Jones from Sheffield. I'm gonna be talking about how we can use unstructured data to look at global trends in marine biodiversity. Um, so as ecologists, and specifically for me as a marine ecologist, um, one of the kind of the big questions that we want to answer is how is biodiversity changing as a result of anthropogenic impacts? So whether that's exploitation by fishing, um, climate change leading to temperature changes and other effects like ocean acidification or acute or chronic pollution effects. Um, and with all of these impacts, what we want to know is how is biodiversity changing? And one of the methods we can use to answer that question are indices. So this, for example, is the Marine Living Planet Index here. Um, we've got a lot of these available to us. Some of the most common ones that I'm sure you'll all recognize, the IUCN's Red List, the uh, WWF's Living Planet Index and the RSPB State of Nature Report. And these are all great and they've done a lot of great work, especially for communicating how biodiversity is changing to the public, but as any of you who are in Daniel Pauly's lecture on Monday will have heard, one index can't do everything and these all have shortfalls somewhere. So, for example, the red list, it's really a snapshot of current status. If you want to look at trends, you can compare changes in status, but it's not ideal. Something like the Living Planet Index, uh, specifically for marine taxa, it's quite good, but it only considers vertebrates, so you're kind of charismatic, economically important fish and birds and mammals. Um, state of Nature, obviously it's UK only, which is a bit of a limitation. Um, the 2016 State of Nature report has actually got a lot better uh, in terms of marine coverage, but it's still quite limited. So the question is, if we want to look at global trends in how marine biodiversity is changing, can we make a better index? And if we're going to, 
the place to look would probably be OBIS. So OBIS is the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. It's like the GBIF of the oceans. Um, it currently contains around 45.5 million observations of 120,000 different species. Um, so if we want to make a taxonomically and geographically comprehensive index, this presumably is the place to go. This represents all of our uh, marine species that we know about, which is about 225,000. OBIS contains data for about half. And if we compare that to, say, the Marine Living Planet Index, which is, you might not even be able to see this tiny little blue bit here, you can see that OBIS represents a great opportunity for us to make a taxonomically um, comprehensive index, as well as a geographic one. So despite some clear biases, so for example in the North Sea, and some kind of more patchy, gappy areas, such as the South Pacific here, despite that, you can see that OBIS has kind of true full geographical coverage. So if we're going to make a new index, OBIS is the place to go. So if it's not obvious, why has nobody done it yet? Well, 45.5 million records, 2,000 data sets. It's going to mean different methodologies, different survey practices and designs. It's going to mean bias, gaps, differences in detectability, differences in recorder effort and recorder aims. I think this map is a good example of that. So you can see um, kind of differences in survey practices here in the Celtic Sea. So this island here, Wales, Cornwall. Um, where you've kind of got more random distributions of points, say, here, and then you have obvious either trawls or opportunistic kind of ferry surveys coming down here. So if we're going to use data like this to try and make some sort of index, we need to account for all these data problems. So where occupancy modeling comes in. So I'm going to be talking about occupancy modeling in a Bayesian context here. Um, and this is a hierarchical model of occupancy and detection, where at one level we have our model for um, occupancy, which is simply defined by whether you are present at t minus 1, by whether you persist, plus whether you are absent at t minus 1, by whether you colonize. And then at another level we have our detection model here, uh, which is even simpler, which is just um, whether you're there by whatever your detectability is. So using this very simple framework, which has been extensively used in kind of terrestrial systems for butterflies, birds, insects, um, we might be able to start accounting for some of the problems in data that we see um, in OBIS. So I'm going to present a little bit of the work that I've been doing for my PhD. Uh, which has been looking at using OBIS data for Celtic Sea mollusks to try and get a handle on the trends in mollusk diversity over time. Um, here we're talking specifically about f approximately 45,000 records from 48 data sets and about 770 different species from the Celtic Sea here. So what's the process? Well, first we download all the data that we have for mollusks. We identify the data sets that the mollusk records come from, and we download those data sets in their entirety for the area of the Celtic Sea. What this allows us to do is build a data set which effectively acts in the same way as a terrestrial traditional bird or insect survey. And it allows us to work under this, the assumption that if these data sets recorded mollusks in one place, they would have recorded it in any other place that they found it. And when we do that, this is the sort of data we get. So you've seen this here before. This is the spatial distribution of points, and this is the temporal distribution of points. As you can see, there's a lot of variation, both spatially and temporally. Um, because we're modeling at the site level, what we do spatially is bin this, uh, in this case, into one degree grid cells, which is kind of the best compromise between spatial resolution and data availability. And we also bin temporally when we run this inputting the data as is in the kind of temporal context, um, the data availability ends up just having a massive effect on our model output. So we bin temporally to create bins of approximately equal data availability. And once we do that, we put this uh, through our occupancy model using the R package Sparta, um, which is 
uh, obviously an R package which implements the occupancy model through JAGS and outputs a time series for each species. A couple of examples of which you can see here. So I should note that these are a non-random selection of species outputs. They don't all look this good. But uh, you can see, uh, let's see if I can remember what these are called. I think this is a, a sea butterfly and a dog whelk. Um, and you can see we get these nice time series of site occupancy over time. And while the kind of the individual species trends are interesting, I think what's more interesting is kind of the aggregated trend or the average trend across all mollusks, which is what we see here. So um, here I've adjusted this to be something more akin to the Living Planet Index um, compared to a baseline. So here we have proportional occupancy against a 1985 baseline. Um, and while we can see there's a lot of variation, so each of these possibly indistinguishable gray lines is a species, uh, there is a general downwards trend in mollusk occupancy. So what does that mean exactly? Well, your average mollusk occupies 22% less sites in the Celtic Sea than it did 30 years ago. And obviously here we're using occupancy as a proxy for uh, either population size or range size, some biodiversity measure. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, we are currently investigating different ways to validate this trend. Obviously we don't have a nice data set that we can mm. compare this against um, as a means of validation, we're experimenting with some different methods. Um, but on the whole, we think this looks promising. So you can see here the Living Planet Index. Again, we see a similar trend here as we do to the Living Planet Index. Um, when we start going through some kind of validation methods, for example, we've started taking out a lot of the species that we have uh, less confidence in. And when we take out the species that we have less confidence in, this decline actually becomes more apparent and even bigger, so it becomes more of a 35, 40% decline in site occupancy compared to a 1985 baseline. Um, so just to sum up, I realize I might have sped through this quite quickly. Um, so I think we need a more taxonomically and geographically comprehensive index of marine biodiversity, and I think OBIS presents one of the best um, data sets that we can use to achieve that. And OBIS in conjunction with occupancy modeling seem to be able to produce um, that index that we really want. In this particular very preliminary example, we see a 22% decline in um, average mollusk site occupancy. And as I say, with, with more validation, that's only going to become more accurate and it's possibly going to even increase to more of the 35, 40% region. Um, if you're interested in more of this, there is a blog post on the OBIS website at iobis.org, which you can um, have a look at. I'd like to quickly thank uh, my supervisors in Sheffield and CEH and their groups, all the people who work at OBIS, and obviously the people who very kindly gave me money. Um, I will leave you with this. Thanks for listening. Um, so it's not something that I have. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, it's it's not something I have specifically looked at yet, but it is definitely something I could and probably should look at. Um, Um, so yeah, that's, that is something I intend to look at, but it's not something I've had a chance to do at the moment. Any other questions? Is there anything you want to elaborate on, Alan, before we uh, No, I don't think so. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we'll just get ready for the next speaker.
I mean, by all means, if you have another question. <laughs> Okay, um, so JAGS is a, let's see if I can get this right. So JAGS is an open source um, operating system independent software used to run Bayesian analyses. So if, if you've heard of WinBugs, it's basically the open source version of WinBugs that will run on any operating system. Um, so it's, it's more kind of, it's a more reproducible and reusable uh, system to use than something like WinBugs, and that runs the the actual occupancy model, um, yeah, via R. I mean, feel free to find me yeah. later, and yes. we can go through that if you like. Right. Um, we'll just close this now. <laughs> and our last speaker for the morning. Oh, whoops, that's the wrong one. Is yeah, this is Kevin from Trinity College, Dublin. So, first of all, thanks for everyone coming, uh, especially after last night. So, I've been really enjoying the conference and maybe last night a little bit too much. And since I'm the last person talking and the last person between you and coffee, uh, I'll get straight to it. So, I'm working with uh, Yvonne Buckley in Trinity College and also with Rob Salgaro Gomez, who is based in Sheffield. And what we're working on is uh, looking at life history variation and the different strategies that species have. So this is a field I've, I've been working on since my PhD, and I'm really, really interested in it because just, you just see such variation and such just really crazy uh, strategies. And a really, really nice example of, of such a variation and, a, and strategy is uh, the Greenland shark. So a paper came out just this uh, year demonstrating it, and um, basically, Basically, uh, they, they looked at the Greenland shark, and this is just a really weird species. I could spend the entire talk just talking about how weird this thing is. It's over a ton, but it's like one of the slowest, I think it is the record of the slowest moving fish, at two kilometers per hour, I think, it busts up to four. Um, it, so it's really slow moving shark, which isn't great for being a shark. So they think it basically scavenges and eats <laughs> sleeping seals. So it's already super weird. It's also super weird because it re really lives a long time. So it lives over 400 years. So it's now got the new record that stole it off the bowhead whale of uh, longest living vertebrate. And more so, I think, is that it doesn't get sexually mature until after 100 years. That's just crazy. So it basically it has to not die until after we're all dead before it even starts reproducing. So really, really interesting. On the complete flip side of that, you can look at these other species such as the seven-figure pygmy goby. And this is a tiny little tropical fish, and it only lives for 59 days. So I mean, barely at all. So imagine your whole lifespan in two months. I don't know why it's called the seven-figure pygmy goby, but I like to think it is because you can express this maximum longevity in seven <laughs> fingers using seconds. And sorry to everyone else who's heard that joke like 10 times by now, but it's still a good one. <laughs> anyway, so you've got this massive amount of variation and we want to explain it, right? So the first place you go to is a classic fast, slow continuum. Some species live long, reproduce slowly, like the Greenland shark. Other species, really, really fast. However, life isn't always that simple. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and there's more to it than just being fast, slow. And indeed, uh, Rob and Yvonne and a bunch of other collaborators showed this in plants just last year. Um, so basically, you can be fast, slow, and completely separately, you can have a different reproductive strategy. So do you invest a lot into 
a few large seeds or do you invest in loads and loads? And so basically we wanted to look at that in animals. So do you see not only just this fast slow, but a separate axis of life history strategies? So to get at this question, uh, we were using the Comadre data set. So this is a fantastic data set, so it's, uh, animal matrix models. And effectively that allows you to get at population level measures of these different aspects of life history strategies. So a very quick uh, acknowledgement to all the people who make this data set uh, happen. So in particular in Rostock, uh, there's a bunch of students who are busy digitizing it like crazy. So I can just basically scrape it all out and shove it onto a slide. Um, and what that allows as well is not only high quality data, but across a really broad taxa. So from corals to mammals and birds and so on. And so using this database, we can start measuring things that we're interested in, in terms of life history strategies. So first things first, you got uh, how long you live essentially, so your mean life expectancy as a type of measure. You can look at things like how long it takes till you reproduce. You can look at things like uh, how long does it take for a cohort to basically replace itself, a generation time. And you can look at other things getting a bit more complex, uh, such as the survival curve type. So to very quickly explain what that is. If you get a cohort at the start, if you look at the up here, everyone's alive. So everyone's up alive here. And if you start to track how many of those are alive as they age, basically you get different styles of um, re uh, strategies. So some species with like values of 0 0.1 in this index, basically most things die early in the life history uh, stages. And then a few individuals kind of make it towards later stages. Things have, uh, some things have the same uh, mortality rate throughout their life history. And then other things like humans, we live quite late and then we all just die in a fairly short period of time. So we have these kind of measures of basically how long you're living. Then you can have some other measures of um, your reproduction. So your mean sexual reproduction, it's pretty standard. Uh, and things like your net reproductive uh, rate, which is basically how much do you reproduce over your lifespan in terms of, it's a kind of a mishmash between your mean expectant lifespan and your reproductive rate. And then you can look at as well the spread of that reproduction. So is it all spread across your entire reproductive lifespan or is it all in one big event at the end? Finally, you can look at your things like your growth rate. So how, how fast are you progressing through each of the stages in your life uh, history? And similarly, going back the way, so when do you regress? And so you might not think it, but some animals do get smaller, for example, things like uh, corals. So you do see a little bit of this. So we got all these different measures, uh, so, and now we wanna look at, okay, can we see some structure to this, a fast, slow, or a separate, separate axis? However, before we get there, we have some other things to look at, body size and phylogeny. So we wanna make sure that, we wanna see the patterns related to body size first, and also the constraints relating to uh, your um, phylogeny. So a very quick run through in phylogeny. So basically you're just correcting for, if you're these two species here, it's more likely that you would have a similar type of strategy or basically we're testing is that there. Uh, just on an off note as well, you have to pick a phylogeny to do this type of analysis. Um, so uh, typically you'd use a consensus tree or something like that. However, we don't like throwing out some data like that. So we use a method um, that basically it's a MacMath Glim model, if anyone's interested, that basically runs the model across all the different types of trees. So, think, so it's a basically a bit Bayesian distribution of trees, and that way you can include the error. So there's actually a package out to do that, if anyone's interested in including that kind of error. Um, and main thanks for Thomas for doing this. So Thomas Aguilera, who's down in Silwood, and the main mastermind of this and that face. Um, so great. So. I'm not gonna talk much more about phylogeny really. Uh, so the second thing we want to correct it for is, or to look at, uh, is body size. So obviously bigger things live longer, for example. We saw that in the Greenland shark. It's not too surprising. Um, but there's other things as well. You can look at metabolic theory. And uh, so basically the bigger you are, it uh, tells you how fast you're burning through energy and has all other sorts of implications in terms of your life history strategies and so on. So I'm gonna just use 0 0.75 I'm not gonna argue about that allometry, um, but we can use this basically to make some predictions on our traits. So for example, 
if we take uh, the top three here, so basically the kind of how long you live, length of time sort of uh, traits, you'd expect a scaling, a log-log scaling of 0 0.25. So basically, uh, yeah, so basically your body size on the x-axis here, and what we find is, yes, you get an increase in uh, mean life expectancy, age of sexual reproduction, generation time with bigger body sizes, however, scales a little lower than you'd expect. Uh, by the way, as well, um, someone was asking me last night, so their lambdas on this, the Pagel's lambdas, are about 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, 0 0.9 on generation time. So phylogeny matters a lot here. Uh, and the R squared is about 0 0.22 to 0 0.26. So again, so it's a fair bit of variation there. So and you can also go look at reproduction, where you would actually, it's a rate, so you'd expect a minus 0 0.25 scaling. And again, you see in the, in the ballpark, but a lot lower than you'd expect. So not as much of, of an effect of body size as you expect. Mm -hmm. Finally, net reproductive rate. Those two things cancel out, essentially. You don't expect to see scaling there, and you don't. So cool. So basically what we found, yeah, so you have body size is important, and uh, phylogeny is slightly important. So now we're finally in a stage to use that data to really look at whether there is a fast flow and a separate axis. So to do that, you basically get all those models and the, uh, you take the residuals off them and you shove them in a big PCA, nice and you know, subtly. Um, and what you get is this. So you got the first PCA axis down here and the second one up here. And so to walk you through it bit by bit, so the different colors are different groups. So the orange is mammals, the, or, sorry, the gray is mammals, the orange is birds, the blue is fish, and so on and so on. Um, so on the first axis, what you're getting is things like mean life expectancy here, generation time, age and maturity. On the other side, you're getting uh, things like mean reproductive rate uh, and how spread out that reproduction is. So basically, this is essentially a fast, slow um, axis. So these, these species down here, like the prairie chicken and the, I can't remember what deer species that is, basically are in the fast lane for their body size. And on the other side, as you, the kind of species you'd expect, so seabirds, uh, coral, uh, and a few primates, and so on, up here. Uh, and they're basically living a long time and reproducing slowly. You also do see separate on the second axis, uh, mainly driven by uh, net reproductive rate in particular, and also a little bit by the, that survival curve. So individuals up here have a really high net reproductive rate, and they have a curve more like we're a human, basically. And again, you can see the kind of species that are spread out there. So you have a species like this mollusk, which is just throwing out uh, reproductive whatevers uh, that do seem to be establishing quite well. These two poor uh, individuals down here, the polar bear, and I can't remember which duck that is, basically, I suspect their populations are just doing pretty badly. And so basically, their net reproductive rate is, is really low. Um, so yeah, so you have, um, so yeah, we do see these two axes. And that's kind of neat then as well, because now we can start thinking about, wait, how does your ecology determine where you are on that axis, for example? So what you can do then is uh, let's, uh, use uh, approaches that we use in an older paper, so um, that we published in uh, Proceedings in 2014. Natalie Cooper was a senior author in that, and I think there's quite a few other authors in here. And basically, you look at things like where you live, uh, that where you'd expect you to put you either in a fast lane or a slow lane, and we use maximum lifespan in this case. So for example, our boreal species, would we expect it to have a lower extrinsic mortality, and hence kind of in the slower lane, you can live longer and so on. Species that are fossorial would be the same, so basically they're underground, predators, not much, of, not much of a problem, and so on. And then you can go through other groups like terrestrial species down here, you can measure them against that. And because we have some other new uh, extra groups in this, you can look at um, sessile groups, whether they're, where they go. Um, pelagic fish, you'd expect them to be in the faster lane. Uh, uh, benthic fish, who knows where they'll go. And then semi-aquatic again, uh, who knows. And basically, if you look at the that fast slow axis and you plot out where these species are, you do find our boreal species are more in the slow lane in comparison to things like pelagic fish and uh, terrestrial species. So th you do start to see these things mapping back into, the, into that space. So altogether, basically, when you're looking at trying to uh, see any structure in the crazy variation that you see in life history strategies, what you do see is that body mass does matter, but not quite as much as you might suspect. 
phylogeny does matter in particular traits, so it actually doesn't matter at all for net reproductive rate. And that basically you can put all this together, you do see second axis, and you can map ecology back onto that. So thank you. definitely look at that. Um, it gets hard to partition it out, so you could look at it very generally. Um, to, you know, I can look at ocean, terrestrial, and so on and so forth. I think some of the modalized stuff gets at a bit of that. So for example, pelagic versus benthic a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's in terms of resources, it's tricky to get that kind of data, I think, or maybe not I mean, primary productivity or something, maybe. Yeah, it's just a nice mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and interesting enough, there might be something in the seasonality in terms of a separate axis that might explain uh, more the H index and species that can revert back, so clonal type things and stuff like that. So they might be in these kind of more difficult environments, let's say, but yeah, I'm still looking into that. Um, so it's still working on it actually, so it basically does look like it's a sound bite. Um, how much you invest in, your, in your each individual reproductive thing. <laughs> so basically, uh, is it a big thing or just loads of eggs? Uh, is there parental care as well? <laughs> Might be important. So I'm still looking at that though. Well, I'd like to thank all of the speakers. Uh, quickly vacate the room because it'll be used for another session. Thank you. Make sure you have everything with you.